And I'm real, I, but I am really excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about an area of research that's been a passion of mine for almost 30 years now. And it's really an honor for me to be able to talk with people who are experts in, who are experts or share my interest in self-determination theory. Um, so, um, so I'm going to, uh, let me go back to the title slide here. Um, I want, what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about second language acquisition research and the role that self-determination theory can play in it. But I also want to talk a bit about how what's going on in, self, in second language acquisition research can inform self-determination theory. So I'm looking for a little bit of an interdisciplinary exchange here. And certainly SDT has had a, uh, an important impact in how we think about motivating students to learn languages. Um, there's well over 100 studies that have been published using SDT as a lens to look at motivation in language learning. Um, but I also want to, but I want to emphasize in my talk today some issues that have risen in second language acquisition research that I think might be relevant for theorizing in SDT. Um, and just so that you are we're all sharing a common ground here. When I'm referring to second language acquisition, I'm re referring to the learning or acquisition or development of new languages after the acquisition of one's mother tongue or mother tongues. There are many people who are multilingual first language learners. Um, and so usually we're talking after the age of four, five, six, when people go into elementary school, most of the research focuses on adults learning languages. Okay, so I think I want to, in as autonomy supportive way as possible, suggest to you or convince you that there are three areas in second language acquisition research, three themes that come out that I think can be an interesting from an SDT perspective. And one is an emphasis on the social context that is perhaps a little more elaborated than what we often see in some SDT research. So not only focusing on interpersonal dynamics, but also socio-structural or intergroup dynamics um, and socio-cultural dynamics. I also want to talk a bit about developmental process, since language learning is the process of development. Um, I want to particularly talk about current trends in SLA that are talking about complex dynamic systems. And then I want to turn um, for a few moments to talk about another, the third theme where we spend in SLA, people talk a lot about imagined or future or ideal selves and communities and what that might mean for SDT. So to contextualize this a little bit, um, there are over 60, there are between 6,000 and 7,000 languages in the world, and there's only about 195 countries. So if you just divide the number of languages by the number of countries, it's pretty obvious that probably most people in the world end up running up against another uh, person who speaks a language that they that they don't. And linguists tell us that over half of the world's population is bi or multilingual. So it is normative to use multiple languages um, and to be learning new languages throughout our lives. And this can happen in formal educational contexts, but a lot of this happens in informal, everyday situations in our daily social interactions. Now, I came to, to be interested in second language um, to be interested in how SDT can give a, a lens for looking at language learning motivation, in part um, because of construct called orientations in the second language acquisition research, and that refers to the reasons that people want to learn a second language. And if you Google reasons for learning a language online, you will find that there are many, many different lists of why it's important to learn another language. And I've come up with this one, which is probably the ultimate list with 700 reasons why you could learn a second language and why it would be a good thing to do. As a researcher though, that's a little difficult to work with. And so what I really like about SDT is that it gives us a psychologically grounded taxonomy for organizing those reasons. And so I'm gonna talk about orientations in very much the same way that we talk about forms of regulation in SDT. So if you need to know more about what 
the different forms of regulation look like it, within the context of language learning. We have a nice little YouTube video that you can look at later. I'm assuming most people are familiar with that. Um, but of course, all research has to start off with, uh, with an instrument that can help us to assess these different kinds of orientations. And that's something that we developed, uh, that I developed with Bob Valeron, Luc Pelletier and Richard Clément um, about 19 years ago. And now we're in the process of updating that instrument. And we've done three studies now looking that, that show us that we can differentiate six different types of orientation or forms of regulation as we might expect. Um, and that uh, the general, so this is the by, by factor exploratory structural equation model modeling technique that Richard Ryan talked about yesterday with reference to the crazy French Canadians. Um, so we did a similar technique inspired by their research and uh, found that on our general factor, we have a very clear self-determination theory continuum. Um, but I'm going to show you a couple of anomalies. Um, so across the bot, so the first thing is we have a strange thing happening with interjected regulation. And across our three studies, um, we have items that reflect a, a negative, what we would think is interjection, but negatively worded, like I feel ashamed when I can't speak a language, I feel guilty when I can't talk to someone else in their language. Um, that that teases out from more positively worded things like I want to impress other people. Um, when I speak another language. And they do seem to differ in terms of um, where they load on the self-determination continuum. And we're looking into trying to understand whether these two uh, types of interjection might predict different things. The other thing you'll notice is that integrated regulation isn't here. And as Richard Ryan talked about, this isn't that surprising, especially in a group of novice language learners like the ones that we're looking at here who are first-year language, uh, first-year university students. They may not have had time to integrate the language into their self-concept. So, um, so we're not particularly worried about this, but it is important to be looking for people who might be integrated language learners. And um, we might think that they might be more advanced. And with this idea in mind, I want to show you some uh, results from a, a qualitative study that we did in which students wrote about why it was that they were learning a, a, their second language, among other things. And we coded their responses and we looked at whether or not these people were English as second language learners, so people who had come to Canada from other countries to learn English, whether they were heritage language learners, whether they were learning a language that was the language of someone from their ancestry, maybe their parent, maybe their grandparent, maybe someone even further back, and then modern language students who would be learning a foreign language, so for instance, Canadian students learning German or Dutch. Um, and what you can see is that we can find people who are integrated in their regulation. And particularly, 80% of the heritage language learners indicated that they were learning the language because it was an important part of who they are, and it was integrated into their value system. Uh, um, the other orientations are also interesting. You'll see that heritage language learners are very unlikely to feel controlled in their language learning, whereas that's not the case with the foreign language and the ESL students. Um, also noteworthy is that the people who, um, relative to the other groups, the um, foreign language students tend to be more intrinsically motivated. They like, they're, they're more likely to say that they're learning a language because it's fun. And yes, language learning can be fun. Uh, <laughs> that last set of bars is for another theory and I'm not going to go into it now. So that's great. We can document these different reasons and we can peg them into the different self-determination theory uh, forms of regulation. But of course, we want to predict different outcomes. And so you'll no doubt recognize this model from the um, self-systems model of motivational development from Skinner and her colleagues. And of course, it's been used widely among the SDT researchers where the social context it presumably affects our um, self-dynamics, our feelings of autonomy, competence, and relatedness support. And in that, in turn, affects our engagement or our action with regards to learning a language. And then there's various outcomes that could happen as a result of that engagement. 
And in many respects, learning a second language can be just like any other subject. So here we have examples of, uh, from this study with Ali Dinser that took place in a remote region, remote, by remote I mean far from Istanbul region of Turkey, um, where people don't speak English very much, there's, no, there's hardly any English speakers. The teacher supports students' basic psychological needs and in turn, the basic psychological needs will predict different aspects of engagement as talked about by John Marshall Reeve. And you'll see that agentic engagement in particular um, predicts achievement, um, but also emotional engagement predicts achievement and cognitive engagement predicts um, absenteeism in class. Um, so I don't think anyone's very surprised by this model. We can quibble about you know, uh, the different relations between engagement and so on, but that's pretty straightforward. But language learning is more than an academic exercise, and we need to think about what happens outside the classroom and how that might be important. And I'm going to talk about um, three things that we need to focus on here, and that the first one is the opportunity for contact. And I would... I, alluded to that earlier in talking about the ESL students, the heritage language students, and the foreign language students. The ESL students have contact with English speakers. The heritage language students may have contact in the family context with, with speakers of the target language. And by definition, the foreign language students don't have contact, regular contact. So the opportunity for contact seems to play a role in the different orientations that people experience. It's not just about contact, though. When we're talking about intergroup contact, intercultural contact, we also have to be mindful about who's a majority group and who's a minority group. And at this point, we need to start thinking about intergroup processes um, and intergroup relations and social identities. And then, of course, there's other aspects, um, such as ancestry. So I'm going to continue with the example of heritage language learners and return briefly to the, the issue of um, minority and majority status. So we can simply expand our model. That would be the simplest thing to do, so that we're thinking about not just what goes on in the classroom, but what goes on outside the classroom as well. So if you look at the far to your right, um, we're looking at outcomes, or what we prefer to call capital. And we can make a differentiation, as Bob Gardner did, who's a, one of the founders of motivation and language learning research. Between, we can make a differentiation between linguistic and non-linguistic outcomes. And linguistic outcomes are language proficiency. We usually go to a classroom and learn a language because we want to get more competent in it. Um, and we often measure that through academic outcomes like scores, grades in a course, or achievement on standardized tests like TOEFL, or some other kind of um, test of proficiency. But Gardner also emphasized that there are many non-linguistic outcomes that come from learning a language, and he was particularly interested in what the implications were for intergroup contact, communication with members of the target language community, because that's why we learn a language, right? That's ultimately, we want to go out and communicate with other people. So do we do that? So the outcomes are a little more complex. It's also the case that the, um, the, the interpersonal supports can be more complex because it's not just the teacher and the people in the classroom that can support our autonomy, but also our family members, um, depending on um, their attitudes towards language learning, their attitudes towards the target language community can all come into play. And of course, the target language community itself. If you have an opportunity to interact with people, are they autonomy supportive of you as well? Okay. And this, again, is you know, another model um, that, of course, has different variations, but you've seen many models like this already um, in this conference. So what we did was we made things a little more complex, and I'm trying to jump over to point to you. But on the far right, not only have we looked at what's motivational intensity or engagement and behavioral intention to take another course, um, and their course grade, we've also asked them about how much contact they have with the German community. And then over here on the, your left, um, 
We have asked people about their autonomy support from family members, community members, and from their teacher. And for the foreign language students, you can see that the teacher has a pretty strong role here. But when we look at the German heritage language learners, so I'm sorry, I forgot to say, this was a study of German students in 14 universities across Canada, so it's quite a large sample. Um, but you can see that the community plays a role as much as the teacher does, if not more. So um, the community members are also important for supporting the sense of autonomy and also um, sense of competence and sense of relatedness. What's also interesting, too, is that it's not just a question of getting more complex. There's different relationships that are intriguing with the heritage language group. And one is that not only does autonomy um, predict, uh, um, uh, does a sense of autonomy predict um, engagement and course grades, controlled regulation predicts more contact with the German community. And that's interesting because we, we do see people from heritage communities also reporting more interjection. The feeling like they should be learning the language, that they feel a sense of obligation to learn grandma and grandpa's language. And that may foster greater interaction with members of the community, which might be members of their own family, you know, going overseas to visit distant relatives and so on but it might also involve the sense of obligation as much as integration. Um, getting back to the idea about, um, so the point I wanna make here is that the context of the world around language learners is having an impact as much as the educational contact, context. And there's many ways we can posit a model that pulls these two dynamics together. I kind of like Landry Allard and DeVos model, and I'm not gonna go through the specific details of it, but um, what they tried to do in talking about self-determination theory in the context of language learning, particularly in the bilingual context of New Brunswick in Canada, where people both speak English and French, it is an officially bilingual province. They suggest that there is a process of social determinism that depends on the relative status of ethnic groups in relation to each other. English tends to be higher status than French, for instance, and that depending on whether you're, you have social networks in your family and social networks outside the family that involve French and English speakers, that can have an effect on ultimately on your language motivation and on your language behavior, whether you use French or English. But that's counter, that social determinism is counterbalanced by a process of self-determination. So to the extent that people feel a sense of autonomy, also to the extent that they have had their consciousness raised about the nature of intergroup dynamics and the extent to which they have their feelings of autonomy, competence and relatedness um, fulfilled, that will also have an impact on their motivation and ultimately their language behavior. So the model, the, the model here is, is quite complex, but it's more than just adding another um, few variables to the general process. There's some other things that are going on that we may need to take into consideration to have a full account of language motivation and language behavior. Um, so that's the socio-structural context. How am I for time? Good, okay. I want to talk a little bit about the socio-cultural socio ecology as well, because no doubt you've heard people say that when you learn another language, you learn another culture. The culture and language are tightly intertwined, and that's, that's, you know, that's a discussion, you know, that's a whole course about the nature of that relationship. But as a basic um, starting point, we might look at whether um, people in different cultures um, might be um, self-determined in more or less different ways, or whether different kinds of dynamics might be going on for people who are learning English, for instance, in Japan, versus people who are learning English in a place like Holland, one being more um, where people might have more interdependent self-construles and, and the other being where people might have more independent self-construles. So we looked at language learning in Canada, and you'll see a model that you will recognize. Um, and clearly, um, autonomy support predicts need satisfaction, which promotes that, which means less amotivation, um, 
more autonomous motivation, and it is related to a sense of more controlled motivation, but only um, slightly. And in turn, uh, less autonomy means more self-evaluative competence, um, uh, more, aut more autonomous motivation means more engagement and more intention to continue studying the language. That all looks completely like we would expect. But an interesting thing happens when we look at the Japanese data. So we do see that autonomy support helps need satisfaction and that that will lead to more autonomous motivation and that leads to more engagement and intention to continue. At least that's the theoretical model. Of course, this is all correlational. But what's interesting is the fact that controlled motivation seems to play a greater role. And in fact, it's quite highly correlated with autonomous motivation at 0.88. So that's really high. So it suggests that there is less of a differentiation between autonomous forms of motivation and controlled forms of motivation. And it, um, I think this is quite consistent with research that shows that feelings of obligation aren't necessarily perceived as controlling in some more collectivistic cultures that uh, the, work of, um, uh, of the work that many other people have done. Um, so, that, um, so that suggests that the sociocultural environment can have a, quite a different impact on uh, motivational processes that we need to be mindful of. Um, things that are developed, uh, programs, uh, language programs that are developed within Western contexts may not be adequately capturing what goes on in other cultural contexts. So the next thing I want to talk about is temporal dynamics, um, and particularly about complex dynamic systems. There's a move towards thinking about language as a dyna complex dynamic system. And it's not surprising that... Um, social psychologists interested in language have picked up some of that and thought, hey, maybe we should start thinking about motivation as a complex dynamic system. Um, and so when we're looking at complex dynamic systems, we're talking about self-organizing systems, which I think fits in nicely with the whole idea of organismic integration um, that SDT um, posits. And we're emphasizing variation rather than general tendencies. And we're looking at interpersonal variation over time and interpersonal variation among um, different people. We want to be attentive from this perspective. There's a lot more focus on nonlinear change. And of course, linear change happens too, but people are really excited about demonstrating nonlinear change. And also, we have interacting systems. So, um, we might think about this uh, in terms of a variety of different systems, but what I'm going to talk about today is thinking about the self-system, particularly feelings of um, forms of behavioral regulation, um, like intrinsic, more self-determined forms of behavioral regulation, and action as a, an engagement as, a, as another kind of system. And so this is a study of uh, English Canadians learning French, and this is our measure of engagement, which is basically a measure of how much intensity you put into learning the language, um, putting in effort, doing your homework outside of class. And this measure was drawn from the second language literature. Um, and what you can see is that over time, this is a random sample of the people from our a small random sample from the people in our sample, subsample. And what you can see is the average tendency, that red line, is for a decline in engagement over time. So this is from the beginning of a semester to the midpoint of the semester to the end of the semester just before final exams. And people's active engagement in the course drops. And this isn't surprising, perhaps, because this pattern is demonstrated in several studies that over years, across semesters, over time, our engagement tends to decline. And, you know, in some ways, that would make sense. I mean, how many of you rev it up for the end of the semester? Most of us are getting kind of tired of it, right? And preparing to move on to the next thing. But from an SDT perspective, we would think that your engagement should correspond with your intrinsic or self-determined motivation. But when we look at that, you can't see it quite very clearly in this particular sub random subsample, but there's an increase over time. People are more self-determined over time. So the slopes over time are not corresponding. 
And so we did a parallel growth curve analysis to look at this. And you can see um, over here on your left that the intercepts are correlated. So the, you can think at the mean level um, that intrinsic motivation is positively correlated with engagement. Um, now, intrinsic motivate, the slope of intrinsic motivation and engagement is also small but positively correlated. And remember, the slope for engagement is going down, so you kind of do have to do a bit of mental gymnastics here. But what it basically means, I've picked two hypothetical people, Alan and Betty, and what it basically means is that in the case of Betty, even though she started off very low in her intrinsic motivation, it's steadily going up. And even though um, Alan's intrinsic motivation is relatively higher, it's not changing very much. And that seems to correspond with putting the brakes on the decline in engagement. So the more, intrinsic, the more your intrinsic motivation rises across the semester, the less your engagement will decline. In other words, you'll tend to keep it up. Okay. So, we can think about these two systems as interacting with each other and having an impact on um, how each of the, the systems unfold. Okay, the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to was this idea about imagined, so of imagined or future or ideal selves and communities. And... Um, Two researchers here are really, uh, have really brought this idea to the forefront of people's thinking about like, second language motivation. And the first is uh, Bonnie Norton and her colleague Aneta Pavlenko. And drawing from Benedict um, Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, um, Pavlenko and Norton state that, it is, that they argue that language learners' actual and desired membership in ima imagined communities affect their learning trajectories, influencing their agency, motivation, and investment and resistance in the learning of English. So that nutshell, if I elaborate it a little bit, means that it's not just about how you're feeling in the moment, but how you imagine yourself engaging with other communities um, in the, in the possible future as a potential that can affect your motivation. And Aneta um, Pavlenko and Norton um, emphasize, have looked at ESL learners who come to Canada, uh, in the case of Bonnie Norton, and have looked at people who imagine that one day they will be able to engage with friends in a cafe and laugh over jokes in English and that's their imagined community and their imagined possible future. Whereas other people imagine relatively negative things. They imagine that uh, you know, they don't want to be a part of a particular community. And I have a personal example. Uh, when, I started, um, when I started my undergraduate university, I started in French literature, and I had an English professor who had a goatee and he would continually stroke his goatee and say, que dirais-je, que dirais-je? And I thought, I don't want to be a part of that. <laughs> so I became a psychologist and a linguist. I became a scientist instead. So and I, the, to me, that really resonates, that, that thinking about what the potential, what would it mean for me to do this in the future? Zoltan Dernier and his colleagues have um, focused in on that idea of the future self or the possible self, um, drawing from Tori Higgins' research and Hazel Marcus's research. Um, and they have argued that we need to think about how language learners' actual and desired memberships in imagined communities affect their... Oh, sorry, that's the wrong, that's the wrong quote. Oh, dear. Um, basically, they focus it narrower on to what extent can you imagine yourself... Um, being a speaker of that language, and to the extent that you can vision, you can you can do visioning exercises to see yourself as improving in a language. That that would be really important. Um, we haven't done a lot of research along this line, but I but some of the correlational research that we're doing now is we're. Um, looking at our measurement instru instrument, how we have included measures of the ideal self. And it does seem to be that the ideal self predicts things like the intention to continue studying the language, 
more strongly than self-determined regulation, um, particularly identified regulation. So it looks to me like we need to be thinking about this future, this possible, this potential self, um, in addition to thinking about how this is integrated into our sense of selves. Um, I think this is um, also an interesting area because we are doing another study about people who are learning Latin. And it turns out that their imagined sense of self uh, and an imagined community is a bit complicated because, of course, there is no Roman community anymore. Um, but, they, but nonetheless, they do imagine a sort of more... Um, prestigious, either prestigious or rather um, a, a community of people who are like-minded and interested in these esoteric sort of things. A little geeky is the way they describe it. Okay, so in sum, I've tried to argue here today that SLA approaches to motivation can perhaps bring some ideas to SDT. Um, because in SLA, these have been the focus of, of a lot of research attention, including elaborations of the social context or social ecology, going beyond interpersonal relationships to look at sociocultural, sociostructural and sociocultural dynamics, looking at developmental processes from a complex dynamic systems perspective, and thinking about our potential imagined selves and communities. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you. And on this um, slide, it's not here, but I understand that in Dutch, it's dank you. So, thank you.